the mighty, mighty pound. Look at you all. Hundreds of people here for the live. Love you guys. Let me say a quick, couple of quick hellos. Catherine Rosa Baker is turning up in the chat tonight. Just turning up. Uh, Roger's here. John David Ricker says, turn my mic on. We would, but you don't have a mic. You got a, you got a keyboard. Gabriel Torres, I see you. Jay Luther, what's happening? Uh, whole gang is here. Dr. Horton is here. Good, a- good afternoon, sir. Steve Schmidt. All right. Um, I would love to say hello to everybody, but I got to miss a few. Um, because we have so much to do tonight. Before we get started, Michael, who are we sponsored by? Duncan, just hit the music. What do you mean? <laughs> oh. Uh. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. Liftoff. 30 minutes after the hour. God, that gets dumber every time, but I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> the koala bear just seals the deal for me. I don't understand it, but I love that it's in. Don't there. overthink it. I never do. I never do. I'm no people know me as an underthinker, so don't worry about it. Liftoff is an automated asset allocation slash financial planning site that we built in conjunction with our friends at Betterment. Um, you go on there, it's goals-based financial planning. So you make some decisions about what you want to use your money for and when, how much you're putting into the account, how much you want to add to it as the year goes on. And boom, we show you the right allocation. The portfolios were built by Michael Batnick and our investment committee. Comes with a koala bear stuffed animal. There's a koala bear involved. No, but I have a, I got a, I have a non insignificant amount of money on that platform at this point, and my wife and I are adding every month. You know what I and did this week? Actually, now that you said that, I wasn't even going to mention this, but I got some checks for Logan's third birthday party or mm. birthday. Troll guess where they? Guess what? No, they went into my account. No, just kidding. That's they have right. their own. That's right. What is he going to do with it? He's just going to spend it on alcohol. Throw it in the account. <laughs> All right, let's get rolling. Mike, you're up first this week. What do you got for me? Okay, let's start with uh, a little something different. I wrote today that investors have gotten used to spending a lot of time near all-time highs. And obviously, obviously, that's not the case anymore. Stocks are in a obvious drawdown. And when I say obvious, it's, like it's, it's obvious now. right? It wasn't, I'm not saying that it's been obvious, but it's obvious. Stocks are going down. Um, yeah. And so for the first time since... 2000 since the great financial crisis we've spent uh, tomorrow will be the hundredth day below the 200 day moving average john if you'd please so this is the s p 500 the dotted gray line is the 200 day moving average the red is when we're below the black is when we're up and i don't think that there's anything especially significant about the 200 day you could pick the 180 the 220 it doesn't matter the point is it's just a long-term moving average and it just if you were to take if you were to take the black and red off this chart if you were to take the s p 500 off this chart and only look at the 200 day moving average it very clearly tells you what the primary trend is and right now it's lower what's significant about the 10 month moving uh the the 200 day is that it's roughly equivalent to the 10 month moving average so it's like not a full year, it's not a calendar year, but it's a period of time where if you consider yourself somebody that like just even casually follows the market, it would be impossible to not know if the trend is up, flat, or down. So like for me, that number is, is significant because we all say it's significant. So see, like it's, 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 not, it's not different than anything else where if enough people believe in something or pay attention to it, it's simpler then than by that. definition it has, it has meaning. No, it's simpler than that. It's just trend, right? It's the higher uh, – rising prices attract buyers, falling prices attract sellers. It's that simple. And here's why it's significant. So today I looked at this. The annualized standard deviation on a 30-day – well, the, the annualized standard deviation. Forget about what I just said. Um, for the S&P 500, when, when stocks are going up, when it's above the 200-day moving average, is 12.6%. When it's below, it's 24.5%. So that standard deviation for people doubles. is is a measure of volatility. So it doubles. And it's not just risk. Uh, return. So I looked, I looked out one year. The average one-year return for the S&P 500 when stocks are above their 200-day moving average is 10.6%. And when it's below, it's 6.9. Not nice. We said this in April and nobody really wanted to hear it. Um, but like the, the big thing with whether or not the market is above or below this particular moving average, like any moving average of length, but this one in particular, 
is not like, oh, throw out your financial plan. It, it, but what it does do is it, it should, if, you, if, you understand, if you're aware of the stats that you just reeled off, what it should do is it should change your behavior. Stop looking for V-shaped bottoms to get all bowled up on. Stop getting bullish at VIX 20 after the volatility is leached out of the market for a few weeks, which just happened and, and failed again. Like, st- uh, lower your expectations for Chart this year's on. returns. There's Chart so on. many. There are so many takeaways that are not the equivalent of saying throw out your financial. Yeah, because look, if you got all bared up uh, below the 200 day over the past decade, you lost money. That's right. Um, but the point, the point that we've been making is that those V's. Look at those vicious V's that we've seen. That's over. It's done. It and you'll, this time. And you could see, what's that? It failed this time. It failed. That's right. it. You, and you could see it in the next chart. So Nick Madruly created this for me. Again, we haven't been below the 200 day moving average for this period of time. Holy shit. Look at this. Is that 2009? Since, since the great financial crisis. Yeah. It's so this is the longest. Up. How many days? How many it's, days? It's 99. We tomorrow, tomorrow will be 100. 100 days below the 200 day. And two failed, two failed rallies to get back above so far. One in March and one two weeks ago. So, you know, this is like the kind of thing where it's like, all right, we're not saying don't invest, but this is a market that's actually rewarding people that are being tactical or that are selling calls against their holdings. And it's been a while. It's been a while. That are holding more cash or not using leverage. It's like a whole host of things that people who are successful this year are doing that were not a positive or contributing factor really for most of the last decade. They just weren't. And now all of a sudden they are. So I think that that's really the big takeaway. One more chart I want to focus your attention on. Mm. For the last uh, for the last decade, really, we've been at least within five percent of an all time high at least one time in a rolling ninety day period. Okay, for the first time since two thousand thirteen, we've gone ninety days. Look at this. Without being within five percent of the all time high. First time yeah. since 2013. That's there were, the no there, V. There were, there were times in there where we were within uh, 5% of an all-time high for 90 straight days. Think about Remember 2017, the least volatile year ever mm. besides for 1995? So it's been 90 days and we haven't been within five. So it's different. The market is acting different. You, you, you can't deny it. That's what it is. So a lot of the stuff that you put up was about the S&P. I looked at the NASDAQ over the weekend. Uh, I hit publish on Monday morning. But um, John, go ahead and pull this chart up. So... Uh, this is a weekly chart, and I took it back five years, and I'm looking at the 40-week moving average, which is roughly equivalent to a 200-day or a 10-month. Like all three of those. Same thing. Right? But I only really look at weekly closes to understand what's going on with the market. Like I've learned not really to focus so much on daily, and then like monthly is too long to be out of touch. So I really focus on the 52 weekly closes that we get each year just for my own like run through of what's happening. And this is the Qs. And the Qs have been leading the S&P to the downside. They've been worse. They were better on the rally. Now they're worse again. Like this is really, I think, where all the action is. The Qs have the biggest stocks, the most popular stocks with retail traders and hedge funds. Um, Apple's in here, Microsoft, uh, a lot of other, you know, Amazon. Everything that really, really matters and moves the needle for the S&P is concentrated in the Qs. So I pay very close attention to this. And this was so, this was clear as a bell. These two failed uh, recoveries that did not turn into Vs. The first one was, was March. And then you can see that second one really clearly, just like the S&P turned away at that simple moving average, that 40 week simple moving average. And just for fun, I took this chart back 10 years and we have never spent this much time below the 40 week moving average for the Qs. This is wild. Uh, look at this, dude, this is it. This is like the worst the NASDAQ has been in a decade. We really, I mean, it's not, it's not even close. It's by double. It's not even the close. Let, the let, it's not even close. And I, by the way, shows absolutely no signs of stopping. So that's like, I, look, I know a lot of what we're saying is like what's already happening. Fine. But I think that situational awareness in a year like this is probably the thing that stops you from compounding uh, any allocation mistakes you've already made. Do you agree with that? It matters. And, and it takes a while for the behavior to change. Right, because uh, you bought the dip fifteen times and it worked fifteen times, and right. the sixteenth time it stopped working, and now that behavior is being unlearned and uh, 
So we're, in, we're, we're on the other side of that. I want to do one technical thing that is uh, po- potentially hopeful because I don't want the show to turn into doom porn or anything like that. That's not how we feel. That's not how we, we operate. So I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. Let's throw this, uh, John, throw this up. It's a last minute edition from Steven Sutmeyer, my friend at uh, Bank of America. I think he's one of the best technicians out there. So this is like basically showing the difference between a cyclical bear or, or, or the definition of a cyclical bear market in the context of a longer term secular bull market, which right now you still have to give the benefit of the doubt that we're still in this secular bull market that started back in the spring of 2013 when the S&P took out the old highs. I got some bull ammo say. later. I got some bull ammo later for the show. All right, so this is the 40 week, um, which we have now violated to the downside and we are below it versus the 200 week which would represent the secular longer term trend. I'm just going to quote Sutmeyer and then we'll move on. Our 2022 view is cyclical correction within a secular bull market. The cyclical trend is tied to the business cycle, while the secular trend encompasses several business cycles. Investors can use the 40 week moving average, which is similar to a 200 day as a proxy for the cyclical trend, while the 200 week reflects the secular trend. The pattern for the SPX of a falling 50-week MA um, above a rising 200-week MA suggests a cyclical correction, a.k.a. bear market, within a larger secular bull. If this pattern stays intact, a decisive push above the 40-week moving average would provide a bullish cyclical signal. With All right, so that's where we are. So it's, it's, way, too, it's way too early to throw in the towel on, on the, the secular bull. And uh, I think that's a really nice illustration of that concept. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. I buy it. All right. That was easy. Okay. Uh, The second thing we're going to get to is this has been a great market for short sellers other than the periodic investigations of short sellers who publish research to uh, Twitter. Outside of that, a lot of very popular shorts uh, outside of the meme stocks have been paying off. Anything high multiple this year has been a really easy place to make money from the downside. And now, according to the Wall Street Journal, you're starting to see more across the board short bets on the overall stock market. And they're using futures and they're using the S&P. So let me set this up, Michael, and then I want to hear what your thoughts are. Net short positions against S&P 500 futures have grown in the past couple of months, reaching levels not seen in two years. Traders are increasing their bets that the index will fall. Um, many traders and portfolio managers are, uh, let's see, hold on. Uh, and then they're, and then they're using, uh, ETFs as well. So that's, that's in the futures. Um, and simultaneously they're pulling money out of us stock funds. So last week, 1.2 billion came out, uh, net outflows, um, in, in a one week period, uh, investors have pulled out 44 billion from equity funds in just June and July. I don't know how much went back in for the balance of August, but um, S&P futures contract netted more than 260,000 short positions as of this Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday. Um, And these seem to be somewhat aggressive uh, short bets. John, do we have this pink chart? Can we throw this up? So this is what it looks like. And you can see the activity from 2020. And of course, those shorts, those short positions were obliterated by the actions of the Treasury and the Fed, who are not coming to the rescue this time. So are they pushing their luck again, or is this the one that sticks? What do you think? I thought it was interesting that they ramped up and as opposed to covering into the rally, given how vicious the bounce was. I thought that uh, Greg Boodle, head of equity and derivative strategies at BNP, had a good quote. He said, positioning doesn't necessarily drive the direction of the market, which I would agree with. But once the market trades in a certain direction, positioning often impacts how it trades, which I would also agree with. To the point about money coming out of the market, Ben Johnson, a few, a few weeks ago, wrote, um, July was the fourth consecutive month of outflows from U.S. mutual funds and ETFs, which is the longest streak since their data set began in 1993. Well, how about that? A lot of... Uh... A lot of the commentary this summer has been about like earnings are holding up and margins um, all time high 
and like the stock market disagrees with you know uh, the the consumer because like, the corporation at, the corporation is better is in better shape than the consumer. So that was, that I think that was really the salient point is like yes the 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 earnings have held up because. These are like the 500 best comp run companies on the planet, and they have a lot of levers to pull and a lot of ways to navigate an environment that a regular consumer doesn't have. Correct. But the thing is, if you believe in this maxim that my spending is your income and your spending is my income, at a certain point, you get a critical mass of consumers for these companies' products and services that just say, <laughs> we're done. And I really think that that process takes a lot longer than three months to play out. So I think it's early to marvel at how well corporations have weathered the storm. I don't know if the storm has even started. I really don't. I don't I don't think we've seen enough layoffs yet. I don't think housing prices have come down to where they're ultimately going to arrive. I think there are a lot of reasons to say that that call of look how great our companies are is way premature. Okay, I would agree with that. Uh, so when is the time to we, where we could say, hey, Okay, corporations did it. They made it through. Is that what if we see what if we see Q3 numbers uh, ratchet higher, and guidance comes back? I think the best thing that's going to take place in Q3 is that buybacks will probably keep the market from crashing. I don't think anyone's going to have any good commentary on uh, trends with their earnings. I really don't. Why would they? You'd be you'd be a nut uh, not to use this as an opportunity to tamp down guidance. Everyone else is already doing that. So actually, if you pull energy out of the S&P 500, um, guidance is already bad. Like if you take the growth from energy, and energy stocks are 4% of the index. So as great as the growth coming from energy is, it's still not a big enough contributor to offset what we're going to hear elsewhere. So look, I, I don't want to be the person that looks at everything as glass half empty, but it's just, it's too early to say that the shorts are overreaching here. The fundamentals are only now starting to head in their direction. I read somewhere that it takes, that historically, it takes like 18 months for activity in the housing market to spill over into like corporate earnings and the real economy. So if that's the case, we're really only six months from the top of the housing market. It could still be extremely early um, for the effect of a decline in housing um, to, to start being felt in the economy. Like it, it could still be way too early. So um, it's, it's really tough to say that this is a, a, a stretch by the shorts. All right, this and just more, might and more, be their environment. In more bullish news, let's, let's move on. Um, all right, let's get back to inside the market. Uh, this, Wait, we had that, hold on. We had that else? retail purchase of inverse ETFs. Oh, yeah. Was that up while I was talking? Yeah, uh, no, it wasn't. So this is not at a peak, um, but it is, it is definitely in an uptrend still on the year. This is 21-day rolling net purchases of inverse ETFs or ETFs that bet against the market by retailers. Yeah, I have no, I have no sense of how big this is. It's two billion sounds like not a large amount of money. Consider what they're doing though. They're betting against an asset that I understand. almost always historically goes up. So it's there's got to be some trades. meaning there. But the yeah, the dollar amounts are, are paltry. I agree. Uh, this is kind of wild. Over the last this data points from Bespoke over the last 12 trading sessions. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond has been either the best or worst performing stock in the S&P 1500 on nine days. Circus. Is it going up now? I, I think it was a oh, bed. It was up 12% pre-market. What did it do today? They had like a, they had like a, a non-catastrophic earnings report, right? Uh, oh, oh no. yeah. No, the, it was the worst earnings call I've ever listened to in my life. Oh, really? Uh, you wait, yeah. you listen. <laughs> wait, this is the breaking news. I know. I listened to the one last. No, before Ryan Cohen got involved. Uh, did you listen to this one? Didn't they just have one? No, they reported a few weeks ago. Oh, um, this stock thought, is still up. This stock is still up over a hundred percent in the last thirty days. Uh, anyway, it was down ten percent today. Yeah, uh, I have no comment. Hang on, on a minute. It, 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 it opened related activity. It opened at fourteen fifty and closed at twelve. Wow, it's almost as though the fundamentals have nothing to do with wow. how it's trading. Well, the fundamentals of the stock are, are horrendous. Um, all right, I just want to point out, we spoke about uh, value and growth last week and how you don't like the distinction, but I do think it's useful just to, just at a high level to look about how different areas of the market are performing. Throw this chart up. The top pane is value. I made this chart yesterday or the day before, so maybe it's a little bit stale, but you get the point. 
Uh, what this is clearly showing to me are that cyclical names, value names have have bounced harder, have held up better than growth stocks, which we already know. There's just an easy way to show it. Wait, since when? Uh, you, since you the lows. Recent, you say since recently? The lows. Since the lows. Value stocks did not fall as much, and they bounced harder. How can you tell from this? They, it looks my eyeballs. My eyeballs. Um, Look how this was in percentages. Look how much closer they are. The top hand is to the highs and the bottom one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Growth is very, very, very far off the high. Value is right there. But both are in downtrends. Correct. And, you know, low valuations aren't going to help you, especially if you own low valuation um, cyclical stocks that require economic growth because you might not get it. All right. Uh, we spoke about this. I, I think we highlighted this a few weeks ago. There's a blog, Quantifiable Edges, and they looked at – John, before we get to the green – let's do the next one first, please. So what happened here is, what, is what's called a breadth thrust. You yeah. had basically no stocks above their 50-day moving average to 90% of the S&P, right? Like that was a vicious, vicious bounce. So they – look, look how washed out we were. Holy shit. We got to like 5% of stocks above a 50-day. So they went back to 1950 and they looked at how many times were less than 15% of stocks above the 50-day moving average to over 90% of stocks above their 50-day moving average within 50 days, right? Mm. How often has that happened? So it's not a ton. Uh, what is this, like 15 times just eyeballing it? It's not, a, it's not a huge list. And the main point here is 63 days later, 126, so three months, six months, a year later, 100% of the time stocks were positive. Mm -hmm. This is meaningful to me. Okay? It's not it's not it's not 50 times, but still, this is this is what we got. I'm trying to understand like the stocks went from It's basically it's basically saying this is what happens at bottoms, okay? So you've got 2020, 19, 16, 11, like when stocks are so washed out, when yeah. basically no stocks are in an uptrend and then within a 50-day period all of them are in an uptrend or all of them are above their 50-day, they call that a breadth thrust and this is this is this is the math. 100 percent of the time, it's it's been higher. Okay, so since then, we've seen a very significant deterioration. Mm. So they then went back and looked. Okay, so does this deterioration negate the breadth thrust? So what they did was, how many times? And I know we're data mining, but still, I think it's meaningful. How many times did that happen? Where? Under 15% were above the 50-day to over 90% above their 50-day. And then following that, um, uh, the S&P 500 closed at a 20-day low. Like how often has that happened? So within the breadth thrust, how often has that happened? And again, 42, 63, 126, 252 days, 100% win rate. And just look at these dates. How many times was it raining though? Shut up. This is, okay. this is, this is basically after a breadth thrust – you see a pullback, and mm -hmm. does that pullback mean that the breadth thrust was invalidated? And according to this, uh, according to, to what we've seen so far, the answer is no. So if you're looking for some bullish uh, bullish data, I present can I, you can I ask this. You a question? Can I ask you a question, though? What are we looking at? 42, the 42-day? 42 like, what do you want to key in on? A month any, from now? Any, dude. Well, no, but I'm asking for a specific three reason. Month, like, asshole. Three months, six months, one year. No, I'm not saying there's anything to, uh, misleading about this. I'm asking, like, what do you think is the one most worth focusing in on? Like, out of all these days, from these are days that's not from the, the thrust, that's, right? That's not the point. No, no, no. I get it, but I, like, I just, don't know. You choose. Well, because here's what here's I guess here would be my comment. How different are these returns from returns absent a breadth thrust? A breadth thrust on average, Dude, like one hundred percent win rate. No, well, okay, that's obviously notable. I wouldn't okay. disagree. I, so I see that. I see that as significant. Okay, so but we're saying the average return o over the next sixty three. I days. didn't say anything about the average return. All I said I was the win I rate. What the win rate? The win rate. I got it. I'm saying something. Shut off. Saying, I want to see. I want to see your face when I yell at you. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, let's take the sixty three day. Why? I don't know. Because I asked you for it's one three of these months. And you wouldn't give it to me. Okay, so we're saying that. In these exact conditions, historically, a bread thrust, a big correction after the bread yes. thrust. By the way, that's not okay. like hardcore data mining. It's, it's a bread thrust I followed know. by a pullback. Listen, okay. you, I, I almost feel you're, you're defending yeah, a, something yeah. that I haven't even, uh, I haven't even said anything about yet. <laughs> just, 
The mic take, is yours. Go. Take take a breather. So we're looking at like the sixty three percent uh change the sixty three day percentage change on average or median. They're both nine percent, and it's a hundred percent win rate. That's pretty great. Like if I if you told me market's going to be nine percent on average, market's going to be nine percent higher now than uh, uh, sixty three days from today. I would say that's a huge that's a huge win. It doesn't get us back to all. And by the highs. way, just use your noodle. I'm telling you, and you know this. A nine percent three month change is way above average. If you just look at all rolling three month, well, so that's what I'm actually trying to get to. That's what I want to ask. Significantly higher. What is than average? What is rolling? Well, three if, months? If, if, if 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 a one year average return is nine percent, mm. I don't know if you could just do extract you know extrapolate like this. So say a two and a quarter percent. I don't know. This is way higher. Nine percent in in, in sixty three days is way higher than normal. Did you look at the dates here? I did. Um, these were, these were all corrections within uptrends. Three Actually, of these. Uh, Two thousand nine was not an uptrend, but three of these were like directly related to inflation uh, issues, like in the in the early to mid seventies. Um, the the market fell off. Like the 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 seventy two seventy five stuff. That's the the Yom Kippur war that saw like uh, oil oil prices. I right, nobody needs a history overnight. lesson. What I'm I would saying, say is like what I would some, say. There's some shit here. Uh, now here's why you throw out this data because we've never, (laughs) (laughs) can I have the last six minutes back? (laughs) We've never, we've never, we've never been in this sort of, uh, economic environment before. We just haven't. Well, you could say that in every economic environment. Well, true, fine. But, 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 uh, this is unusual. This is an unusual period that we're living through with you. We've got a super tight labor market, uh, no unemployment, uh, inflation, super high fed removing liquidity. We've never had this sort of situation before but i do i do like data like this because i do think that that the behavior of buyers and sellers matters i'll still like i'll take my trend stuff over over bread thrust stuff same you know what i mean same like i'll pay attention to both but if i have to err on one side or the other you could keep your bread thrust before we you know until we break above convincingly into a i don't even need an uptrend i i completely agree this data for me personally does not invalidate are we going higher and lower and right now we're going lower yeah. All so right. I agree. Let's do this really quickly. Goldman Sachs um, is really enjoying its Gen Z uh, workforce. Uh, this article so, is stupid. Yeah. Well. Six people left. That's what I was going to say. Oh, my I, God. Six people. No, but here's the difference, though. These are Gen Z. So they don't do anything without making videos about it. Do you understand that? Okay. Like, the, like every year, people don't work out at Goldman Sachs. They're hiring it's a, it's a, it's a stress factory and they're hiring all type A's and not everybody can, can make it through these programs. Obviously you could say the same thing about like a med, a med school program at any, uh, prestigious university. You could say the same thing about law firms. You could, it's just, it, listen, not everybody that the Knicks take and ends up, uh, sticking it out. Like it's, it doesn't matter who or what you are or what you're doing. This is one of the best organizations in the world. But the difference is, my point is, um, this is the first generation that literally like can't go to the bathroom without making a viral video about it. Are you caught so, up on industry? Uh, I'm not caught up, but I'm I'm very much in. I'm very involved. Um, I have favorite characters and everything. But so, all right. So this is, uh, I mean, these are like things that people are saying at, to the New York Post. Six overworked first year bankers quit and walked out en masse. From yeah, that, that, that literally made me laugh. <laughs> from en the mass. bank's 200 West Street headquarters. Have you been on West Street? If you don't have 600 people, no one will notice. It's a highway. West Street is literally. like West Side Highway. Yeah. So please don't say en masse with a straight face. Um, but this is like a reporter that really wants to tell us a, a specific story. Um, uh, the final insult was low compensation. LOL. These people are all six figures yeah. right out of school. It just it gets dumber as you read it. And I like Goldman's response. Goldman is seeing a record amount of applications for roles like these. Of course, <laughs> good, of course, I good are. luck. All right, um, but anyway, it's an adjustment. It is a new generation, and I just find it interesting that. You know, they. This is like the first couple of years where they have enough of these people where they're going to start making an impact within the firm. Um, we have a chart for some reason. I don't know. We don't need this. I was just. We don't yeah, need this. Yeah, no, Goldman yeah. will be fine, I guess, yeah. is what we're showing. Um, 
Bloomberg did this thing where Gen Z shows TikTok what life is like on Wall Street, where confidentiality is key. Again, this is just funny because like um, these are firms, hedge funds, investment banks, where secrecy is like a business. It's like a, tr it's like a, it's like a uh, something that makes the the bank valuable that they can keep secrets, that they operate in silence. And now they have this whole generation of kids that are like, so here's what I had for breakfast at Goldman Sachs. And they will record these videos until the point where you literally take away their phone and then they will borrow someone else's phone and record a video. So I don't think it's going to work to shut them down. Bloomberg did this thing about how some banks are actually encouraging it, um, which I think is smart because if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, what are you? What are you? What are your thoughts? Are we gonna? Are we gonna see the street eventually just succumb to? Hey, this is what it is now. You want young employees? This is what it's gonna be like. This can't be good for these young people's career. What? What can't? To like be broadcasting this stuff. Oh, it's well, unless they become the new bosses of the firm, and this is just what the culture becomes. Nah, I don't buy that. No. Like, like at least the millennials no. like spend a lot of their time like. Kind of like quietly, like I'm smarter than my boss, and it was true in most cases because their boss was somebody my generation or a boomer, and they just like kind of like simmered, and maybe they would go on Twitter and anonymously be like, "This place is so stupid." The like, but these kids are like, "Hey, look, here's a video, literally, of my boss getting into her Honda Accord. Take note of her license plate number. LOL." Like that's a whole yeah, but different those are, those are now. dummies. That's not the whole. It can't be the whole generation that's behaving that way. Uh, Gen Z Americans have grown up sharing right, their lives enough. on Who social cares? media and see no reason to stop just because they've entered the corporate world. For Wall Street, where confidentiality is bred in the bone, this poses a conundrum. Unfiltered day in the life videos can serve as a recruitment tool for. Yeah, okay. All right, um, whatever. Look, we're, gonna, next. We're, we're moving from this. I'm bored. Okay. Uh, I predict there will be some uh, drunken events where these videos get out and it's only a matter of weeks or months and it's just going to be like we're either going to decide it's cool calm down or it's going to be an uproar so i don't know we'll see what happens uh dan rasmussen uh from verdad did this really good post on what's going on with the s p 500 versus really everything else it's been the king over the last decade um and if you've tilted away from the s p 500 it has not been enjoyable. So let's get into some of the, the, their findings. They said that over the past decade, international stocks went from trading at about a 15% discount to U.S. stocks on enterprise value to sales to a 50% 50, 50 discount. Now, Josh, let me just go through these charts and then you could offer some commentary. Um, then they broke it down. They went a step further said, okay, let's look at U.S. value. Let's look at developed Europe value. And let's look at Japan value and EM value. And the discount to the to the S and P has continued to go negative. So you say to yourself, okay, surely there are reasons why. And forget the stories. Like, just look at the businesses. Look at things like return on assets and profit margins. And how have those done relative to the S and P? Does that support the the deterioration or the the uh, discrepancy in performance? So the, what they did was they looked at return on assets of international. Uh, value and small cap relative to the S and P 500. That's this chart. So you see that international and value have traded out of the discount uh, based on return on assets. Small cap has been, you know, sort of in line. But the point is, they have not deteriorated nearly, 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 nearly as much as the performance has diverged. Then they show the same thing with EBITDA margins. Okay, is it that? Nope, that's not it either. Again, these are EBITDA margins of international stocks, U.S. value and U.S. small cap versus the S&P 500. And then you say to yourself, okay, what about growth? Surely that must be responsible for it, is that U.S. Uh, US large cap stocks are growing quicker than the rest of the world. Uh, sort of. Um, next chart, please. You've got value in orange, international in blue, and U.S. small cap in gray. And are they? This is a three-year three-year revenue compound annual growth rate minus the S and P five hundred. So is the S and P five hundred growing faster than value stocks and international stocks? Uh, yes, it is. But to the extent that there is a massive gap in performance and valuations, no, not even close. Uh, and that is the story. 
I think the whole thing can be explained by the U.S. Federal Reserve like, and, uh, and the S&P 500 being heavily weighted toward tech and consumer discretionary. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think what is that. It, but what, is that, what does that mean, the tech and the consumer discretionary? Why is that? We why just that happen to have, we just happen to have very large companies that were meaningful to the S&P that were perfectly positioned and calibrated for an explosion in a uh, in in uh, central bank U.S. Uh, central bank largesse combined with uh, uh, I think a, a a more resilient consumer like the European consumer like European consumers for the most part um, they do, they they don't act as cyclically as U.S. consumers do they pinch pennies they live on a budget especially in retirement they have a specific pension coming from the government. They don't deviate from how they spend money. And when they make a purchase, like an iPhone, it's like, it's like the whole fucking world stops for them to calculate, is now the time to, to make this purchase. The US consumer is drunk on credit, borrowing money from its own stock portfolio, um, literally has a Fed creating a bubble every five years. The only job of the US consumer is to survive the bubble and the crash so you could make it to the next bubble. And it's just a whole different vibe. Like, we're Americans. We're So look at the stocks that make up the S&P. I don't just mean Apple. Like, it's Home Depot. It's Amazon. It's This is just, this is how we roll. Like, think about how big United Health is. United Health wouldn't even exist in Europe. This is, this is like a gigantic for-profit healthcare. It's the biggest waiting in the Dow. This would not even exist in Europe. It would be illegal. So... I, you know, I think like these comparisons of um, growth rates and, and ca free cash flow multiples and, um, you know, book value and enterprise value to sales, I think the story is so much easier to understand. It's the nature of the businesses that we have here and how big they are in our indices. So do I think? don't think, I, I think that was a very well put story and I buy 95% of it. I think uh, if I were to speak for Dan, I think he would just say that all of those things that you said are true, but the discrepancy in valuation is unjustified. So can you even show, still, can 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 he show us? I would love to see this, and I don't know the answer. So and hang ask, on, before you, before you, sorry, this is important. Before you ask that question, from 1970 to 2011, one dollar invested in U.S. stocks. And one dollar invested in international stocks grew to the exact. I think it was like I I've done this a million times. I think it was forty four dollars. They each grew to the exact same point over a forty year period. So all of what you said was true prior to two thousand eleven. In two thousand eleven, they have diverged massively. And what changed since two thousand eleven? Is it central bank policy? I think we did way bigger and way faster QE. Mario, Mario Draghi didn't really lay out European-style QE until 2014. When was you whatever know, it takes? Is that when that was? Later. Do you know what Draghi was doing during the financial crisis? I'm not even making this up. They were raising rates. Like, that was their, their policy response to uh, Lehman blowing up and two dozen of the biggest banks on the, on the planet um, going through bankruptcy. Their policy response in the early stages of the crisis was to raise interest rates. As one so does. I just think we had a faster, bigger, more serious, poli more reckless, you could say, policy response. Everyone got bailed out after Lehman. There were no more Lehmans after that. And the amount of money in successive uh, quantitative easing programs we threw at the asset markets dwarfs anything that Europe tried to do. God bless Ben and Bernanke. So, like, I, you know, I just don't think it's... Now... There's no Silicon Valley in in Europe. It's not. They have tech companies. They don't have anything like what we have, where it's like successive generations of companies building on the success of prior companies and um, that muscle memory amongst the VC firms. And uh, they have like there's like two semiconductor companies in Europe, and I know the names of both of them. Like <laughs> there's ASML and and uh, Armor and and uh, and that's pretty much the story there. Like they don't have Silicon Valley in the sense that we have it. So uh, and they I also Boris Johnson enough. Yeah, but the other thing is that before a company became Amazon in Europe, it would be fucking regulated out of existence. It would never have a company that dominant in anything, whether it's e-commerce or 
SaaS or whatever or cloud computing. It just it would be it, it would be illegal. Like the European Union would step on its throat. They would never ever allow for tech quote unquote tech giants or consumer giants the way that we have them here. And I think that that has shown up in stock market returns in the last 10 years. Like, I, I really think that's been been a relevant subject. I'm not even saying no it's good, by the way. No doubt. So, all right. All right. Let's, let's hear the pitch. Let's hear it. Uh, I'm going to pitch Uber to you. Okay. Would you, first of all, what would it take to, what would it take to get you to buy it before I even, like, or how bearish are, are you on Uber right now? Not that bearish. Not, okay, good. It's a good starting point. Um, I, think I, don't stock- know, I don't know how they ever make money in Uber Eats, but fine. But it on. doesn't matter. It got it got them through the pandemic, and now it will shrink relative to mobility. Mobility is mobility is now in growth mode. Uh, a couple of things on Uber. And by the way, we don't do like general financial advice on the show. So I own the stock. I don't care if you buy it or sell it or short it or whatever. It has no impact on me. I'm not telling you what to do. If you are watching, um, I do want Mike to buy it. All right. So I think that this stock. Uh, can be traded off of that 24 and a half, 25 level. That was the price on August 1st, the day before they reported. As you can see, despite the pretty horrendous uh, market we've had of late, this stock has not given up much from that from that gap higher. It did not get and into the earnings gap. I like that. It did not. And it may. It just hasn't yet. So I think 25 is like a tradable level. Are you um, out if it breaks? I'm I'm probably not out, but okay. like if you're if you're like like how do I manage my risk here? That seems like a pretty obvious place to say okay, no moss. So what is that like ten percent ish from twenty eight and change? Um, Uber, this pe- why is the stock not giving up any ground? Well, I think it's notable that it never actually touched its pandemic low. Most of the companies in this category, profitless tech, have gone way through their pandemic low at this point. And Uber is one of the largest names that has not. I think that's notable, in my opinion. I think I think the market has memory back to two years. And the sellers did not show up there. Chart back uh, on. Chart back on. So those are those are obvious lower highs. And I just don't buy growth stocks below the 200-day moving average. That's my only bear case. I just don't do uh, it. Okay. So now it's not very far from that 200. It, like one or two good trading days and it would be above. So I I appreciate that objective. I would also say that this past quarter, if you actually listen to the call or go into the 8K, this is the most important thing. For the first time in history, they had a positive uh, free cash flow number, which is a prelude to profitability. So it is- I was shocked. So last quarter, Dara said, all right, the street wants free cash flow. We're going to do it. I didn't think that they could turn they that battle. Sh- I didn't think they could turn that battle. Sh- Let me take over and give you some, bull- some, some positive bullet points back to you. So, I'm, uh, all right, l- look at Uber versus Lyft. John? Way better. Look at this. That's a ratio chart. Uber is kicking the shit out of Lyft. Like, two, two reasons. Two reasons. The, uh, the international business and the food delivery. Lyft doesn't have either. Um, Mostly U.S., and all it does is mobility. Josh, to your point about uh, free cash flow going positive, there we go. First time ever. Kudos to them. I did not think that that was going to happen this quickly. Well, that's going to continue, too. They're not all of a sudden going to start spending money again. What they've been doing, Mike, is selling off a lot of non-core assets and getting out of a lot of markets that they had no path to profitability. And they're focusing on the places where they can actually make money. That's what Wall Street wants right now, and they're doing it. Uh, the last chart, this is from a new service, at least new to me, stratosphere.io. Uber's revenue going up a lot. Mm. Gross profit look great. going up, operating income shrinking, the, or the losses are shrinking, gross margins still down, but you, there's, there's fundamentally, there's, there's a decent amount to like here. So I don't hate it. I just don't buy growth stocks below the 200-day moving average. I've been burned too many times. They also, uh, we won't get into this now, but they added a taxi feature. So now you can actually hail a yellow cab. And if you get off a plane at an airport or you're just walking down the street in midtown Manhattan and it's like late at night and you don't feel like, um, you know, booking a 30 or $40, uh, essentially like Lincoln town car, um, or an SUV for $80, you can actually just hail a yellow cab. And that's going to be, I think the next, the next leg of the mobility segments growth. In addition to just the economy reopening. So. All right, real quick. I want to pitch you a short Now I'm only kidding, but I just, this is not a, this is not short recommendation, Uber. but, I, but I do want to show you the, the, the uh, I was going to say the worst mega cap tech stock. This is not mega cap anymore. 
this blew my face. This the the market cap of the stock that I'm about to tell you. Uh, maybe you could take a guess. Uh, let's see. The market cap peaked a long time ago. I'm guessing, but the market cap went from uh, even Wait, like what's uh, the stock. You show, about, putting up a chart. Hang on, hang on. Before we get okay. there, I want to give you a chance. So this this stock peaked. The market cap peaked in the dot com bubble. Didn't even come close to regaining it. Uh, most recently in 2020, this had a market cap of 290 billion dollars. The market cap today is 130 billion dollars. Mega cap tech is 200 billion and plus. This is not even mega cap anymore. As I said, this is the worst mega cap tech stock. It's not mega cap anymore. I know I've, I haven't given you a lot, but do you have any guesses? I told you that the market cap peaked in 99. It's a 130 billion dollar market cap. The, the market company... cap peaked in 99 or 2000. Intel. Boom. I'm good so for good you. At this. Good for you. All right, John. Is it? Let's really it is? is. It is. Let's up these charts. Ooh. All right, look, this is a weekly chart. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is monthly. Look how look how disgusting this is. Look at this. This is, And this has nothing to do with the pandemic because the pandemic's been great for semi companies. This is like a this is like a technology problem. They just they're not they're just not what they used to. So be. who's killing them? AMD and Micron? Everybody. NVIDIA. Qual uh, Qual 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 Apple's making. So Apple. Oh, that was uh, a big deal. Dude, Apple's yeah. going to put out. People don't even understand the significance of this. Apple's going to put out its next uh, phone on September 7th. They're going to announce it. It'll probably be out for the holidays. This is the iPhone 14. It's going to be a $1,400 phone. And the chip is like the A. They're up to like the A13 or the A16 chip. This is Apple. This is Apple chips in Apple's flagship product. And yeah, they're paying some royalties to some other chip companies. And there's some like baseband shit in there and whatever but like in the end yeah remember Apple Sarah's was making logic. chips Do you remember Sarah's logic in like 2011 people were like I, I don't you know I like Apple's okay but I like the second I like I like Sarah's logic I like the second how'd, how'd that go <laughs> um, Does that thing still trade last one last last chart just look at this drawdown this is about as bad a drawdown as the stock has had since the great financial crisis this is this is not listen good. i respect this company and they've had an, an incredible legacy of innovation and i know they still supply like some of the most important markets around the world with chips so it's no disrespect but like this is a ceo who's like running around announcing plans to like build in ohio and put americans back to work and all this shit. and i hope it works out but like the stock price is not impressed by any of what this guy's out there doing politically like the stock, the stock price is saying, dude, you got You better figure out something innovative and fast. The stock price um, was at was here in 2014. I mean, this looks bad. Ugly. Looks really, really bad. bad. By the way, this is the next name to come out of the Dow. Yeah, I don't yeah. even think they're going to put another semi name into the Dow, but this ain't going to stay. So I'm thinking Amazon goes in. If, um, I had to guess, if I had to guess, yeah, that's a good call. All right, uh, good, good job, Josh. That was a pretty good guess. Okay, uh, are we are we going to Duncan or do we have one more? Oh uh, no, we're done. Duncan, get in here. Duncan, get in here. What do you got? Hey, I was gonna say Intel. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Oh, you I were never too. Look at you. Never That's would have guessed it. That's we funny. had several people in the chat say it though. That was kind of impressive. We had several. All right, time is time is time is, yeah. time is running. Let's roll. All right. So first up, we have a question from Michael. Michael writes, I have quite a few tech stocks down fifty to seventy five percent, and was wondering when it makes sense to sell and walk in losses and reinvest the funds elsewhere. We've gotten similar questions of this a lot. So this is a popular question. It was so hard. If I, if I, I knew I the wish future, there was a great you, yeah. I wish there was a great answer that would be universally applicable, but I don't know what the stocks are. And some of them will recover and some of them will go to zero. And I just, I don't, I don't know. How about this? Whenever, you, whenever you're asking that question, the answer is almost now. It usually doesn't Ooh. get better. I mean, that's a, that's a that's broad a brush. All right, so I would just go through this exercise. Ask yourself why you bought them in the first place. If the answer is like a they were friend going tip, up because they were going up. Yeah. If That's the answer it. is like a friend gave you a tip and you really like never bothered to look at the company or research it or learn. Dude, why else would it, you why else do you buy a stock that is now down seventy five percent? it was going up. It was going up at the time and you just like lost track of it and let it get really, really bad. I have Isn't one of trend threes. following? No, it's the opposite. Trend following, no matter what no matter what you think about the stock. At a certain price, you're just selling it because it's going down. Oh, gotcha. This is this is this is trend non-following. If you're if you have a 75% uh, loss in a stock, I wish I wish there were a better universal answer, uh, Michael. Thank you so much for submitting that. I think we gave you the the best answer that we could. 
with the limited amount of information that we have. Okay. Up next, we have a question. Wait, I have one. I have one more answer. Yeah, yeah. If if you say you know I can't sell it today. Okay, fine. Uh, but I would say that make make a rule now. You say like I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it another ten percent and I'm out. Or if heaven forbid I get a twenty five percent pop, I'm out. But the problem is when these things pop, you kind of get a little bit of hope back in you and you start thinking, ah, I may see, I wasn't, I wasn't an idiot for holding on. And that's usually a rally that, that fails. So that you, does you're happen. not, you're not yeah. getting back to even. So just forget about that. No, no offense. You're not getting back to even highly unlikely. So whatever you decide to do, I would write it down. Well, that's actually a good point. Like if we're saying down 50 to 75, down 50 to 75 from what, from your, your entry, what is the significance of that? You know what I mean? Like that doesn't really mean anything in the context of the the company, the stock, or anything. That's just some random day that you decided to pull the trigger. Just yeah, don't, I don't, definitely wouldn't anchor to that. Because if you get a bounce, you're going to be suckered back in. So if you get a bounce, I would write it down. If I get a bounce, I'm going to take the exit. All right, next question. Yeah, I think a lot of people now are basically asking if they should dollar cost. I mean, if they should. Um, no. What do you call it? Tax loss harvest. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so up next we have a question from Tom who writes, you interact with many great people in finance. Gee, I wish I, I'd have taken such a path that I'm getting ready to retire. However, I do have grandkids. So my question is, how uh, how does someone in their teens is get into not. F- is not, yeah, yeah, sorry. My question is not how someone in their teens gets into finance, but what sort of teen or young adult prospers in the field? Who are they? What are they like? Uh, what lays the groundwork for a young person to go into a career in finance? This is such a great question. Michael, you go. I would say this is probably universally applicable, but it's all about personality. Um, and uh, I, I think that the people that do the best just in life are the people with the best personalities. I don't mean like the funniest person, but just the people that are able to work well with others, the people that inspire, the people that get shit done. Uh, grumpy complainers don't advance anywhere. So I think that is not necessarily like specific for finance i just think people that like or get things done are good people so what's interesting about this question is like so many people who go into finance do you have a similar personality type they tend to be type a people because they're going into an industry where a lot of money can be made um but they also tend to be like very responsible people and people who are either analytical or um uh, predisposed to like liking math and it's interesting when you meet someone who's thriving in our industry, that is none of those things. And um, that's like a creative person who ended up in this industry by accident and was able to look at things differently than all of the quants and the nerds were looking at them. And maybe somebody even that was willing to take more risk than a traditional person entering finance would be. So. You're going to find a lot of successful people who are responsible, buttoned up, analytical, hardworking, et cetera. And then you're going to see some people at the top of firms who are like, how did this guy even get into finance? He doesn't belong here doing this. So I don't know that it necessarily takes a certain personality type or a certain, uh, what are they asking? What do they like? I, I don't know. I feel like there, there's room for a lot of serendipitous things to happen even for people who don't really belong in this industry. I think the reason why I gave that the answer that I did is because the idea that somebody is going to be a math brain, there's almost like table stakes and obvious, it's like the obvious yeah, answer, yeah, and, yeah. but everybody is right. So I think at that point it's about, it's about other things, the intangibles, the, the personalities that shine through. So I yeah, like, like a hundred people can sit and do the same calculations on a spreadsheet all day, which one of them could smile afterward and, uh, you know, take their colleagues out for beers and have people want to be around them. Yeah, it's not. It's not. The That's with, the separation. The people with the highest IQs are not at the top of the food chain. No, I mean, definitely not. In some very rare cases, like a Renaissance, maybe. Fine. Yeah, but that's Other like that. not. Yeah, so I, I would say yeah, get yeah, those for the for the billionaires. Yeah, probably it's the smartest people. But even even then, not even necessarily. No, it's not the smartest people. It's the people in some like. I've, what I've seen, it's the most courageous. Who could tell, and, and who could tell the best story? Yeah, but it's also, it's like. Who has the most charisma? Like, like when I think of like, when I think of like the hedge fund managers that like, like I think of like a David Tepper, right? Like, I don't think he would tell you I'm the smartest guy on the street. I think he would tell you like, I have the biggest pair and I'm not afraid of anything. And it's when markets are down the most that I'm going to do the craziest shit and I've done it, and look how well it's worked out. And I'll do it for people that don't have the guts to do it. 
And like that's not an IQ thing. But the, yeah, I, I would also say the the question is like it should be parsed out like what personality do you need to be the best, most successful hedge fund manager is very, very, yeah, very yeah, different yeah. That's a than point. to succeed in finance because, you know, the David Teppers, there's like four of them. You know what I mean? So just to succeed that's in a, finance, it's not, that's not what it is. That's a really good point too. All right, but great question. And thank you so much, Tom, for submitting. Remember, if you have a topic that you would like to see us discuss on the show, um, go ahead and send an email to askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Duncan reads all of it. And if we end up using your topic that you've submitted, we send you a little present. I think we're sending like a laptop sticker or something. So thanks for all the great topics. Keep them coming. Thanks, everyone who joined us for the live. Um, don't forget, tomorrow is Wednesday. Oh, who do Brand we have? New animals. What is that? Who do we have on, uh, on TCAF? On, uh, on this week? No, no, no. Shh. Shh. Surprise. Surprise. Uh, fan favorite coming on uh, the Compound and Friends Thursday. New Animal Spirits tomorrow. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you next Tuesday. We appreciate you. Good night.